Coming up, we check in with Native historian Ned Blackhawk, who just won the National Book Award. The Land Back Movement is quantified, and professors in Kansas are mapping the details. Plus, a Zuni program aims to bring generations together through agriculture. Stay tuned for those interviews, plus headlines ahead on the ICT Newscast. This program is made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, a private corporation funded by the American people. The ICT Newscast is sponsored by the Indian Land Tenure Foundation, a nonprofit organization serving American Indian nations and people in the recovery and control of their rightful homelands on the web at ILTF.org. Support for the ICT Newscast with Aaliyah Chavez comes from the Arizona PBS studios in Phoenix at the Walter Cronkite School of Journalism and Mass Communications at Arizona State University. Amirawa Hopa, thank you for joining us. I am Aaliyah Chavez. More than 300 tribal leaders were at the White House Tribal Nation Summit this week. ICT editor Jordan Bennett Begay has this report. What's really interesting is like right away, the first panel was about climate change and climate resiliency. And I spoke with a couple of uh, tribal leaders, um, one from Bishop Paiu, um, who they talked about how water is affecting their community. And also I spoke with uh, another tribal leader who is up from Alaska and their community is eight miles above the Arctic Circle. And both of them, you know, outlay how climate change is affecting their communities and how they're going to bring, use their time here at the summit to bring their issues to the forefront. We have a lot of water right issues and um, I think land uh, issues. And so just to kind of put our name on the map and make sure that people know who we are, where we're from, uh, because we're very secluded in our area. So just representing really. Climate change, even though people will not say it, but we hear it, and that's what our elders historically have told us, that you will come to a point where your food security, your hunting and your fishing, and everything we do on land, unless we support it and take care of it. Another big announcement that happened today at the Tribal Nation Summit day one was uh, President Joe Biden signed an executive order to allow uh, easier access for tribes to federal funding Progress. and to allow more flexibility for tribes to spend that money how they want to spend the it. Of the fail you can search Tribal Nation Summit at ictnews.org for more reports. We turn to Colorado now where questions are being raised about a state-led investigation into the history of Indian boarding schools there. The report from the State Historical Society detailed the era's trauma and found that dozens of students died at the institutions. The Denver American Indian Commission says the investigation is incomplete and was conducted without proper representation of Native scholars and laypeople. There is no greater subject matter expert than the survivors and the descendants of the boarding schools themselves. So even outside of having a degree or even a background um, in academia, you know, there is no one who is better positioned to speak to um, the trauma and the barriers to boarding schools than our own community. History Colorado says that the state's governor has requested a million dollars in his budget to, quote, continue this work in a way that is tribally and native led. In the Amazon, a tribe is approaching the brink of extinction, but a new leader is fighting for her people. ICT's Pacey Smith Garcia has more. Along the shores of the Asua River, the Huma are fighting back after nearing extinction. The tribe, which was down to four people in the 1990s, is now at 24 people due to the work of Mande Huma, the Huma leader who is the first female chief of the tribe. Mande and her father helped lead the return to their traditional land, which is nearly the size of Las Vegas, following their removal to a nearby village. The land also holds cultural and personal significance to the Huma. When we are within our territory, it's as if we can breathe more freely. Our territory gives us strength. That's what our territory means to us. 
Despite the return, they still have to fight to retain their land, Manday explained. Because we were few, people didn't recognize us, didn't respect us. There had never been a woman leader before. And then people came to tell me, you shouldn't have assumed it because you're a woman. Along with fighting to preserve their culture, they are trying to ensure the rainforests and rivers that surround them survive, with the area being a hotspot for poaching, illegal deforesting, and ranching. When we pass by a newly deforested area, we feel sad because trees have been cut down. Trees' lives are the same as people's lives. Cutting them is like killing people. The water shouldn't dry up so much like this. It's much hotter. It wasn't like this before. Our concern is, why is this happening? Because of deforestation. The tribe is now taking defensive measures to ensure their land and forests are safe. Manday's nephews use boats to patrol the river, and they use drones to look out for poachers, loggers, and fishermen. Pacey Smith Garcia, ICT News. And those are the headlines for the ICT Newscast. Yale historian Ned Blackhawk is envisioning American history through a new lens, putting Native people at the center of the narrative. This month, he won the prestigious National Book Award for his work, The Rediscovery of America. Stuart Huntington caught up with Professor Blackhawk from his office on the Yale campus. I'm just thrilled beyond belief. Um, and also last week at the National Book Awards, uh, there was a, a major prize bestowed by um, uh, Ojibwe author Hyde Erdrich to a Chamorro um, poetry finalist who won the National Book Award in Poetry, um, uh, Craig Santos Perez. So Craig and I constitute 40% of the recipients of the National Book Award last week. That's kind of a historic moment. There's a Native American judge, Hyde Erdrich. So there are also a lot of Indian peoples uh, at the event. So it was really kind of... Um, Revelate, revelatory experience uh, that hopefully um, kind of signals that the publishing world, like contemporary Native American media in so many ways, is starting to get uh, transformed by Native authors and writers. Sir, I wonder if you would uh, synthesize, summarize your thesis in this book for our audience. I'm happy to do so. My book is entitled The Rediscovery of America, Native Peoples and the Unmaking of U.S. History. And it actually has a pretty simple thesis, uh, which is you can't understand the history of the United States without its Native American and indigenous populations. The book uh, has that kind of simple uh, argumentative claim early on. Um, it recognizes how indebted uh, the project is to a generation or so of scholars who have all been working really diligently and effectively at rediscovering American history. That's where the title comes from. Uh, it makes another claim that in order to understand the centrality of Native Americans to U.S. history, we have to unmake the conventional paradigms that have often um, excluded or marginalized Native Americans. And so to do so, to give you some examples, I divide the book into two halves, part one and part two. And the first half of the book examines what I call part one, Indians and empires, which is the centrality of indigenous peoples to the evolution of European imperial societies across North America. And it ends with a substantive chapter on the revolution and then on the constitution. And then part two opens essentially the second half of the book, which is another six chapters, which is generally titled Struggles for Sovereignty, where I locate uh, the challenge of federal Indian affairs at the heart of the evolution of the 19th century American state. And so that second half um, starts roughly around the time of ratification of the constitution in the late 1780s and goes to the present, and four out of those six chapters are largely about the 19th century world. So the 20th century receives uh, two um, uh, significant chapters that overview uh, the kind of first half of the 20th century and the second half, using the Second World War as a primary uh, demarcation. So in each of these sections, uh, we could talk about the Civil War, we could talk about uh, the evolution of the French Empire, we could talk about the Spanish settlement in the Southwest, uh, the emergence of Indian activism in the early 20th century that bred uh, the Society of American Indians, which pushed forward the American Indian Citizenship Act, which we'll be commemorating next year. Um, in each of these areas, uh, it's undeniable that Native Americans were central to the course of American history. You call the Native Americans in California the first casualties of the Civil War. Correct. Uh, and you also uh, talk about the Revolutionary War 
as being prompted by native issues on the frontier. Correct. Um, these are uh, different ways of seeing what are the central parts of every high school American history course. Right. Um, and it is a big undertaking to rediscover American history. And I do say early on that it's going to take generations for this to kind of come into really full uh, formation. Um, and the claims about the Civil War are a little less kind of cause. Uh, ca there's a little less causation there than in the revolution. And so I just observe, based on the scholarship of other people, that the federal government starts funding California's state militias after the after the South secedes in 1860 and early 1861. So before the Battle of Bull Run, before uh, really the major battles of the Civil War are unfolding, California state militias, which had previously been receiving state funding for their atrocities essentially against Native Americans or campaigns against them, now receive federal funds. And so why can't we think of these um, these campaigns as part of the Civil War since federal funding was at the heart of those initiatives? So that's just kind of one example, um, but it doesn't have the kind of causation. I'm not saying the Civil War started in California, although the incorporation of the West was the central feature of the causation of the war more broadly, as uh, many would know. Uh, but I am saying in the Revolution chapter that the articulation of anti-Indigenous ideologies and ideas, which make it into the Declaration of Independence, the last grievance of the Declaration of Independence is against the King of England for inciting a merciless Indian savages to attack our frontier inhabitants. In those terms, merciless Indian savages or frontier inhabitants come from not Virginia, at least not Eastern Virginia, not the gentry classes that Jefferson and Washington were from, or Madison and Monroe as well. They're not coming from Boston, where Sam Adams and other kind of merchant leaders are operating um, busy seaport economies. Those are frontier concerns, and they're coming from the interior. And I spend a lot of time in that chapter kind of ar um, arguing that from the aftermath of the Seven Years' War, which ends in 1763, to roughly the late 1760s, a very distinctive anti-Indigenous ideology has formed that is animating settler grievances against not just the crown, but Native Americans. And there are massacres and battles and other kind of forms of frontier rebellions, essentially. And I call them settler militias that are erupting across Pennsylvania and other backcountry regions throughout that fateful decade. But those have not been seen as central causes of the revolution. And so the subtitle of my chapter on the revolution is called The Indigenous Origins of the American Revolution. Sir, that's fascinating. Thank you very much for your time today. It's been really a pleasure. Thank you for inviting me to Indian Country today. A community steeped in agriculture for generations is being acknowledged for its work. The Zuni Youth Enrichment Project has been awarded a Culture of Health Prize. ICT's Dalton Walker spoke with board member Joe Clonch, and Shirley Snavy has this interview. Something that's really neat about Zuni, or something that's really important about Zuni, is that every Every song, every prayer, every ceremony really re includes agriculture at its core. And it, it includes bringing the moisture that's going to be needed in order to support the agriculture for the benefit of the community. Because we're able to reach the kids in school and then also support that work that's happening at home, it becomes it becomes more of a holistic approach to um, to teaching about nutrition, to teaching about uh, relationship to land, to be to teach about um, practicing, you know, one's culture and 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 what that looks like, um, even in 2023. The pandemic changed us. For the pueblo of Zuni, it brought back the tradition of gardening. We always struggled with our community garden program. Like we just didn't, unless we were busing kids to our gardens, people were not participating. And, and then we were seeing gardens everywhere throughout the community during COVID. And we started to reflect as a program. And, and if you look back at old photos of Zuni, it's an agricultural based community. If you look back at the old photos, the 
the farming that was done was done by families adjacent to the river, connected to the river that, that comes through Zuni. That river has dried. Um, it's been dammed upstream. And so you don't see those gardens in the same way that you did, like in those historical photos. Um, but still, it was a family activity. What we were forced to do because of the pandemic was meet families where they were at. And in doing so, we were able to tie back into the traditional way that farming was done in Zuni. The Zunis have their own specific method for gardening that is unique to them, to their community. It's called traditional waffle gardening. So if you look at the plots, they resemble a waffle. That was a way to keep the moisture in and help support the plant. And corn is really big and traditional crop that families were planting, squash and pumpkins and carrots and cilantro. Um, so it, it was a good mix of the traditional foods that had always been grown there and then also, you know, some, some more recent crops. What we were hearing from parents is my kid really wants to plant a garden this year. So we're going to plant a garden. And they, the, the youth were really the source and, and where the momentum came from to, to, to plant. Um, and once things got rolling and it became like just a really important family activity, something that people were able to do while they were at home, um, and um, we, we were also really interested in how many different members of families were involved in the process of planting per family. And it was on average four, four members of the family. And so that's, you know, the children, that's the parents, sometimes that's a, a grandma or grandpa. And that was really encouraging to see um, just the intergenerational relationships that were um, taking hold as a result of being able to come together to grow food. This has been a core part of how we do our food sovereignty programming now. Um, so every year we are distributing garden kits and we're distributing um, rain harvest kits. Um, and the really neat thing is, is we're in the schools serving the youth directly, um, helping with their school gardens. And so they're getting that ed education at school. And then they're also, we're providing these resources for families. So many of these kids are able to go home and continue what they learned at school, at home with their families. And, and within their families, they're able to take that to a whole deeper level, pandemic, uh, made visible how vulnerable the Zuni community was to the to the food supply chain. Um, Zuni exists in a in a food in a food desert, and the, um, I guess the irony is just a few generations ago, two generations ago, Zuni was a self sustaining you know agricultural based community, and that knowledge still exists, and and what we're trying to do is work with local cultural bearers, local farmers to ensure that those, those traditions continue to be brought forward. All across the country, we hear news of tribal nations getting land back. Whether an outright purchase or a donation, the movement is gaining traction. A project at the University of Kansas is putting it on a map. An idea of MacArthur Fellow Sarah Deer, a fellow professor, helped her create a website to quantify land back. Shirley Snavy and Stuart Huntington have this interview. Let's take a look. The origins of it are probably 10 to 12 years ago. Um, I had found a story about a Pennsylvania farmer who discovered that he was on stolen Delaware land and decided um, on his own accord to find a way to return that land to the Delaware tribe. Um, and uh, they, you know, the Delaware tribe's now in Oklahoma. So Pennsylvania has been a long time ago. And I was just touched by the story, you know, that when we talk about land back, it's not a metaphor, it's actual land back. 
And as a private landowner, I found it very interesting that he would do that. And so I wondered if there were other private landowners that had some interest in donating or returning, I should say, the land to its rightful owners. And I came up with a list over time. Then I met Ward at the University of Kansas, shared the list with him, and he made a map. In terms of the map, it's uh, a collection of uh, publicly available news links that uh, started with the list that Sarah shared. And then I researched um, to find news stories that were already um, in circulation about instances of return of land um, and used uh, an ArcGIS uh, web-based software uh, that's publicly available to create the map and to provide links to the news stories and also to the um, tribe or nation or um, group page of the of the folks who had um, received the land. Yeah, we're still just now getting the word out. Okay. Um, and we hope that, you know, with some publicity that we can get some feedback uh, from private landowners who have donated land or tribal nations themselves. And again, it's just trying to help people think about land back as a literal return of stolen land. Uh, and so we anticipate this to be a dynamic project um, that will be ongoing and re regularly updated with new information that we come into, um, that we that we learn about. We've had students um, involved uh at different points of time at different degrees. Um, this project um, is one that, as, as Sarah mentioned, she shared the idea with me and I've been working on it, but it's not an externally funded project or um, a grant. It's um, our time as, as academics. And there've been some students who've uh, to date donated their time. I do anticipate that now that word is getting out and even just from our own um, accumulation of, of news stories, we may have to change the platform that we're on a little bit because uh, the the number of instances of land return or things that are close enough to land return to be included on the map uh, is going beyond the, the software's capacity to, to host them. Um, and so that will probably be a project that actually involves students a little more and trying to get them opportunities that can help them build their knowledge, but also build their careers. You know, I think think there are probably ways to use this project in, in a context that I haven't even thought of yet. Um, it's primarily right now to educate, to give people a sense of what's happening, uh, perhaps inspire other landowners um, who live on stolen land to be inspired by that and consider themselves uh, where their land is and who it originally belonged to. I also think that it's, um, you know, providing data for the land back movement as a whole to say again, that this is not just an aspiration or a metaphor, but it can actually happen. And then the third audience I think would be, um, you know, other scholars and academics um, who may be writing about land back and can use this map to find specific data that's relevant to their own writing project. So it kind of depends on who's looking at it in terms of how the tool can be used. Looking through the news or, or podcast or whatnot, then I think about the connections between, say, the, the Quapaw land in Oklahoma, where there were lead and zinc mines and, and the connections. Then when you think about that lead and zinc went into so many of the bullets that have been used in wars um, around the wars of colonial conquest in the 20th century. and um, just the connections between how land has been used and misused and how it's being um, returned and, and what condition it's in. Um, Cause that's, that's certainly one of the questions here is, is there capacity to, to uh, manage the land? Well, um, is the capacity remotely close to where the land is, right? Because we have um, here in Kansas, lots of, uh, lineages with different tribes that this is not their ancestral homeland. So it goes to a very basic question of who is the land returned to? Um, so th again, this hopefully it, it helps the, the website 
and its evolution will help people think through different dimensions, legal, moral, ethical, relational, um, around these projects. One of the links we have, because in addition to the map, if you continue to scroll down and are patient, <laughs> you'll get a list of links. And some of those links in, in, inform um, the user as to the legal implications of the transfer of land and the complexity of the return because of questions of taxes and um, inheritance and trust land and all of those things, which we already know are super complicated in Indian country without land back. And so, you know, we would, you know, encourage anyone who is thinking about this kind of project to consult uh, an Indian law attorney early on in the process. To find the map, search for KU Land Back. Right now, the priority is tracking private landowners and corporations returning land. State and federal land returns are not reflected on the map. And that's a slice of our indigenous world. For all the latest, visit ictnews.org. From all of us in the newsroom, stay safe, my relatives. This program is made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, a private corporation funded by the American people.